Well, for a number of years, we have centered this church's Martin Luther King Jr. Day Sundays on God's presence and social justice efforts and actors. When I started this sermon way back before Christmas, I had a hard time imagining how this lesson would fit in. And as I was researching and praying and meditating on it, the carol, Mary, did you know, kept coming to mind. Carol asks if Mary knew Jesus would do the things he's reported to have done. Blessing answers that question. It evidences Mary knew, and it teaches, too, that her voice prompted and pushed Jesus to get involved, solve a concern. And the concern involved a wedding which was out of line, which in Mary and Jesus' day was a much bigger deal than you may realize. Weddings were week-long feasts furnishing guests with enough food and drink. And for most people back then, having enough to eat and drink was a daily concern. So weddings did more than celebrate marriages. They were an oasis of nourishment for the hungry, thirsty. Moreover, the failure to adequately furnish the basic hospitality of food and drink not only deprived nourishment to those in need and deprived the host of honor and heaped great shame on them. So running out of wine was a big deal. It was literally shameful and great concern to hosts and their households. Customarily, it was not the duty of guests like Mary and Jesus to make sure the gathered were nourished. Nonetheless, Mary thought it should be their duty. Strikingly, Jesus did. And it's striking because Jesus is known to us now as teaching that love, caring for the well-being of others, is the primary duty God calls us to. But in the wedding at King, it's clearly Mary, not Jesus, who was the first to act as God's voice, as she called Jesus to help provide what's needed for all the others' well-being. As we heard, once Jesus got on board, his ultimate response was overwhelming. He provided an abundance of the very best wine, 180 gallons, about 1,000 bottles of what we might equate today with very expensive champagne. This is one of those... Bible stories, modern folks can get all tied up arguing about ways to understand it. Some insist it must be read literally and understood as Jesus actually turning water into wine. Others insist it must be read literally and understood as unbelievable, since turning water into wine is impossible. There is, of course, a third way to read it. It's a story with truths and deeper meanings than whether Jesus could literally turn water into wine. Like many biblical accounts, getting bogged down debating the nature of a reported miracle misses the point. What ought to be our primary concern as Christians is to find how God is still speaking in the story in meaningful ways. That's the point. That's the everlasting value of Scripture. Changing water to expensive wine Nice to learn, but I can say with some certainty that's not our call as Christians. It doesn't include doing that. Nor does it include solely being impressed the story says Jesus did. So the story must have other meanings. And sure enough, it's often understood to be about turning scarcity into abundance, repaying hospitality or providing for the needs of others without a family, all of which Jesus does in the story. Those meanings are fine and good, but they tend to gloss over the first part of the story, that jarring part where Mary has to get the body of Christ up and running. And I want to focus on that part and suggest a way to understand it is to remember there's a long tradition in our faith of referring to the church as the body of Christ. And that it's not unprecedented to understand Jesus as sometimes representing the church in our gospel stories. In addition to suggesting that Jesus can be understood as a metaphor for the church 
today's reading, I want to suggest that Mary, Mary can also be understood as a, a metaphor, the voice of God. And she calls on Jesus. He's a surprisingly reluctant body of Christ. She calls on him to act. Mary said to Jesus, they have no mind. And Jesus initially replied, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. And the body of Christ in the lesson gives two excuses. It's not their concern. And it's not yet time to act. And while it's hard for us to imagine Jesus himself giving such excuses, sadly, it's not hard to imagine churches giving them. Which leads me to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., famously call out churches for giving such excuses in anti-racism struggles. In 1963, liberal clergy, liberal clergy in Alabama had publicly asserted that local civil rights protests over segregation were unwise and untimely. And incarcerated at the time for being in the protest, Reverend King responded with a famous writing, a letter from Birmingham City Jail. And in that letter, he can be heard like Mary in the wedding at Canaan, prodding the body of Christ to act. See, like Mary, Reverend King knew that when the body of Christ goes into action, miracles can happen. Specifically, he knew and hoped and prayed that the body of Christ would do the work needed to help end the awful, unjust, lawful segregation that existed in America. So, Reverend Dr. King prodded the ministers and their churches, the body of Christ, to action, to act. He and other civil rights activists were in Alabama opposing its segregation ordinances, laws on the books that kept black Americans separate from whites that were provided, rights that were provided to white Americans in everyday life. The rights at issue included equal access to, among other things, voting, justice, housing, jobs, schools, entertainment, hotels, parks, relationships, restaurants, restrooms, and believe it or not, drinking fountains. White clergymen had those rights. And those who had it didn't think that the hour had come for the body of Christ to work to change the laws for those without such rights. White clergymen who had those rights didn't think it was the body of Christ's business to help make the change from watery white rights for black Americans to the full body champagne of rights white Americans held. Their approach generally seemed to be just wait, give it time. Racism will cure itself. In his letter from jail, Reverend King responded by first noting that time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. And then he added these words through which we can hear the voice of God still speaking. Quote, More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that time is always right to do right. Now is the time to make real promise of democracy and transform our pending national el elegy into a creative song of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. In Thankful. After those words were published and Dr. King and others continued to protest, more and more churches started responding. The body of Christ got animated and got involved, and so did other faith communities and entities and people. And the result was that eventually a miracle happened. Segregation 
ordinances for themselves out. Sadly, the injustices of racism did not end. And Martin Luther King Jr. fought those and other injustices until the day that he died. And while Dr. King helped awaken churches in the country to end lawful Jim Crow laws, racism has not ended. And there's a lot of backlash and bristling when that fact is brought up these days. I've even heard arguments that local churches should not be involved in opposing racism. I've heard racism is not our concern in places like this where the population is 95% white. I've heard it's not our time to act. I've heard there's no racism going on that's our concern. Those sound a lot like the excuses that the body of Christ initially gave at Cana. And thankfully, this church as a whole has not bought in to those excuses. And most of my time here, I have observed the body of Christ represented by this church involved in overcoming racism, working hard and diligently with other faith communities and entities and people. And miracles have happened. Well, attended discussions and panels on overcoming racism have taken place annually in Knox County for six years. A Knox Alliance for Racial Equality has been formed a historical marker went up honoring Dr. Ella Mae Simmons, a black daughter of the city who faced and overcame racism here at Alton. A public, outdoor honoring of the Underground Railroad and anti-slavery efforts in this town now exists on that wonderful bench outside this church. Dan Emmett, the primary founder of Blackface Minstrel Shows, is no longer honored with a festival or on Welcome to Our Towns. A year ago, the city of Mount Vernon itself produced its first ever webinar on racism. And just a few months ago, a band that honored the Confederacy was challenged by a network of anti-racist citizens, and the band's appearance was canceled. And around that same time, the first ever Mount Vernon civil rights walking tour took place, starting at the bench I mentioned, and ending up here at our beautiful stained glass windows dedicated to our anti-slavery friends and founders of this church and featuring biblical heroes as black men. This church and others work to make all of that happen. The body of Christ animated and in action is a part of those wonderful local miracles. Mary and Martin Luther King Jr. were right to push the body of Christ to action to address pressing concern. And racism, racism remains a pressing concern. May we continue to act as the body of Christ to overcome it without excuse, by actively seeking justice and loving kindness as our God requires, 